Right, today I've come to London to see St Paul's Cathedral. St Paul's Cathedral has a long history of burning to the ground. In 1666, the Old Norman building was uh, burned to the ground, and in 1087, the Old Saxon building was burned to the ground. What came before the Saxon building, we're not sure, but it's likely that it burned to the ground. Someday in the future, new St Paul's might also burn to the ground. St Paul's Cathedral is the masterwork of Christopher Wren, but it's not actually how Christopher Wren saw it when he was alive. But it is perhaps how Christopher Wren imagined it would eventually be. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is Christopher Wren based his designs for St Paul's Cathedral on the Italian cathedrals of Florence and St Peter's Basilica in Rome. He also drew inspiration on Greek cross cathedrals like the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. How However, for the Protestant population of England in 1666, this seemed very Catholic, very concerning. Not really the sort of thing we want in our nice, good Christian England, thank you very much. After all, we are the true Christians, not those Pope worshippers. So the first design that Christopher Wren put forward, the Greek cross design, was rejected outright. That wasn't going to happen. But the second design he put forward, the so-called warrant design, was accepted. This had a traditional cruciform outline and had a much smaller dome than the original Greek cross. The advantage that the king saw in it, which is why he gave it its royal warrant, hence the name, was that the design could be built in stages. The choir could be built and then the nave and then the transept and slowly the building could take shape. They wanted a working building as fast as possible. This meant that Christopher Wren could change the design as the building work went on and people grew more accepting of what Christopher Wren was trying to do and he got to put the magnificent dome that we all know onto this new design of a building. This is not to say that Italian neoclassical designs were out of favour. Far from it. This was the start of classical architecture's heyday. Porticos were coming into fashion and Inigo Jones had been hired to put a disgusting looking portico onto the old gothic St Paul's and Christopher Wren had already been hired to look at ways to uh, make old gothic St Paul's look like more of a classical cathedral. So the general public were very keen to have a new modern classical architecture cathedral. They just didn't want it to be as overtly Catholic as Christopher Wren's desired design. And although people grew accustomed to the exterior classical masterpiece that we all know and love today, on the interior they kept strict Puritan values. White walls with a few accent colours and that was it. Obviously, that's not how it is now. Christopher Wren always wanted it to be decorated in a style like this. He imagined that it would be full of paintings and frescoes and mosaics, just like the cathedrals in Greece and Italy. But the people that he was building it for did not want this. So it fell to the Victorians and the Edwardians to complete the design. All of the gilt all of the paintings, all of the mosaics, all the stunning decoration you see on the interior came after 1860. Some of it is 20th century. What I consider the iconic look of St Paul's has been there for less than half the time it's been standing. When it comes to visiting St Paul's there is quite a high ticket price. As a sightseer you're charged £20 to go in. Personally I think that's worth it. I've been twice in the last two years. Probably won't go again now for a little while, but I feel I've got my money's worth out of it. You get a really good audio guide that takes about two hours to take you through the whole building, and there are guided tours quite regularly with very knowledgeable guides. You can exhaust them if you want. They're, they're fabulous. Well worth it is taking a trip up to the Whispering Gallery, which is the uh, gallery on the inside of the dome, the Stone Gallery, which is an external gallery at the base of the dome, and all the way up almost to the very top of St Paul's. It's about 500 steps up, which, believe me, is a lot of steps. It may not sound like a lot of steps, but it's a lot of steps. 
It's not for the faint of heart. There are spiral staircases, narrow corridors. There was a passage where the walls were right up against my shoulders. You can take an elevator to the Whispering Gallery, but if you want to go higher than that, you will need to take the stairs. Still... It's a lot better than how Christopher Wren used to have to get up there. In his old age, he used to get winched up in a basket like a sack of bricks. There are far fewer burials in St Paul's Cathedral than there are in Westminster Abbey, but I think it's the better for it. The two that dominate are Nelson and Wellington, and deservedly so. I really like the way the crypts are laid out, as it gives each individual a space with respect that they deserve. Whereas in Westminster Abbey, it can feel like people are getting a bit crammed in there cheek by jowl. If for any reason I was to do a great service to the nation, I know I'd prefer to be buried in St Paul's. I could easily talk about St Paul's Cathedral for two or three hours if you let me. There's so much history and interest in this building. It's an engineering marvel. It's had 400 years of accumulating history and it's got beautiful art throughout. But I think I'm going to leave it there because the thing that really interested me is that the decoration that I consider an integral part of St Paul's Cathedral is in fact less than 150 years old.